Welcome all. Um, I am absolutely thrilled to have you here today for our Hispanic Heritage Month poetry reading and conversation. Um, I am Rebecca Olander. I teach writing in the English department at Westfield. Um, and I'm also the editor of Perugia Press, which is a small press that publishes full length poetry books by women at the beginning of their publishing careers. And one of our poets, uh, Jacqueline Balderrama, is one of the poets reading with us today. Uh, first, I want to check in with you about two Zoom items. Um, first of all, I recommend setting your Zoom screen to um, speaker view, which I'm going to do right now. Um, and that's helpful because um, for just for the first half of the event, um, it's in the upper right hand corner of your screen. You can be either on speaker view or gallery view. And gallery lets you see everyone in the room, but speaker view is nice because as each poet reads, you can focus on the poems at hand and not on the, all the little squares of the audience. Um, when we move into conversation after the reading, it would be really great to switch to gallery mode. I will remind you about that. And that way we can have a conversation together as a group. Um, another thing is when you enter the Zoom room, you are automatically muted. Um, later on, well, if, I, if you could please keep your mics off during the reading and also the conversation when other folks are talking, um, but we will love you to unmute during the conversation if you want to ask a question. Um, so in the bottom left hand corner of your screen, you'll see a little microphone. Um, you can hit that and um, make sure that you're muted. I have it set so that you should come into the room muted, but maybe just make sure um, that, that's, that that's happening. Um, all right, so Let's see, um, to ask a question, um, you can do that in a couple of different ways. Um, you can raise your hand during the Q&A, um, which is if you go down to the participants bar on the bottom, um, it brings up the list of folks who are here with us in the room. And um, there's a little collection of things you can do at the bottom of that list. And one of them is to raise your hand. Um, but you can also ask a question in the chat. Just if a question occurs to you when one of the readers is reading and you want to put that in there, um, I'm going to try to circle back to your question in the second half of the event. Um, the chat is also open during the reading for comments and I will be posting poet bios and um, websites and links to purchasing their books there as well. I want to say, as I do at every poetry reading, um, the best way to support poets and small presses that publish them is to buy their books. So, um, and for Jackie's book, since, since I'm the editor there, I, I was able to do a special thing. Um, so there's a special Westfield State discount today. Um, so be on the lookout for that in the chat. It's just for you all who are here at this reading. Um, and before we get to the reading, I want to thank a few folks in particular um, who helped to make today's reading possible. Um, and let's see, one of them is in the waiting room. I'm gonna let him in right now. <laughs> um, all right. Ooh, I muted myself. I was trying to mute someone else. I was trying to be clever. Um, all right, that was done. So let me bring myself back to speaker view. Hmm. All right, so yeah, if folks could just check if you're muted because um, somebody else might be coming up on the screen and instead of me to be speaking to you, but you can also do gallery view if that's not working. Um, so I want to have some thanks to make because it takes a village to throw a poetry reading. Um, this reading is sponsored by the English Department, uh, the Guest Lecture Series, and the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences at Westfield State. So special thanks goes out to Stephen Adams, uh, Regina Smialek, Emily Todd, Marianne Rusi, Enrique Morales Diaz, and Susan Davignon for their support from those departments. Um, thanks also to the marketing department and especially Andrea O'Brien for design and promotional materials and to Chris Hurdle of University um, Media Services for help in coordinating the tech aspects of hosting on Zoom. Um, thanks also to all the departments who promoted this event to your students. Um, for instance, history, um, EGST, language and culture studies and our new diversity, inclusion and equity coordinator, Alicia McKenzie, welcome to campus. Of course, thank you to each of the poets for taking the time to come and read and visit with us today. And thanks to each of you in this room for coming to listen in. Uh, I wanna let you know about our program. 
Our program will feature three poets. They'll each read about 15 minutes and that will be followed by a conversation between the poets and you, the audience. Um, we're going to begin with Susie F. Garcia, move on to Francisco Aragon and close with Jackie Baldarama. And I will now introduce Susie. Susie is the author of the chapbook, A Homegrown Fairy Tale. It's put out by Bone Bouquet 2020, hot off the presses. Garcia is an executive editor at Nomi Press and the online editor for the Mich Michigan Quarterly Review. She is a Canto Mundo Fellow, a Macondista, ma and participated in the first ever Poetry Incubator at the Poetry Foundation. She currently serves as the Canto Mundo Regional Chair for the Midwest and as a member of their steering committee. Garcia's writing has been featured or is forthcoming from Poetry Magazine, The Offing, Vinyl, Fence Magazine, and more. She has presented at the PCA, ACA, the AWP, and the Consoling Passions Conferences and other national conferences. And for more info, you can visit her website. I'm going to put her um, bio and her website up in the chat so you can muse on that and check out her website later. And um, please welcome Susie Garcia. Susie, I invite you to turn on your mic. I'm going to turn off my mic so you can be on stage. Welcome. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Thank you to everybody who has been a part of creating this reading. I'm so excited to be reading with Francisco and with Jackie. Um, and it's always nice to connect with more students and faculty um, across the country. So I really appreciate y'all taking time out of your day today and just kind of communing with us. Um, I do think of poetry as a community activity. Uh, so I'm so glad that we are sharing this virtual space together, even if we could not share a physical space together. Um, I'm going to start out by reading some poems from the manuscript I'm working on, and then I will be reading some from A Homegrown Fairy Tale. The first poem that I'm going to read is called A, Mod a Modified Villanelle for My Childhood. Um, and I have a little acknowledgement here that I wrote it with some help from Ahmed. Um, if y'all don't know Ahmed, he's a rapper from the 90s. Um, he has this amazing song where the bridge is just um, something like, back in the day when I was young, I'm not a kid anymore, but sometimes I just sit around and think about or sometimes I sit around and wish I was a kid again. And it was a song that would get stuck in my head um, for a while while I was writing. And it helped me kind of, the way that the bridge formed and reformed and came back almost like a chorus, but didn't come back like quite like a chorus, was very interesting to me. And it helped me think about the form of this poem, as well as obviously his song is about childhood um, and the poem is about childhood. So um, I strongly encourage you to go, I will put, I'll put the link to the song in, in the chat after I'm done um, reading so that y'all can listen to it later um, and kind of see where I'm coming from with it. But yeah, I just want to acknowledge uh, that, you know, our creativity comes from a lot of different places. Um, so this is a modified villanelle for my childhood. I want to write lyrical, but all I got is magical. My book needs a poem talking about I remember when, something more autobiographical. Mi familia wanted to assimilate nothing radical. Each month was a struggle to pay our rent with food stamps so dust collects on the magical. Each month it got a little less civil. Isolation is a learned defense when all you want to do is write lyrical. None of us escaped being a criminal of the state institutionalized when they found out all we had was magical. White room is white room, it's all statistical. Our calendars were divided by Sundays spent in visiting hours. Cold metal chairs deny the lyrical. I keep my genes in the sharp light of the celestial. My history writes itself in sheets across my veins. My parents believed in prayer, I believed in magical. Well, at least I believed in curses, biblical or not. I believed in sharp fists beat myself into lyrical, but we were each born into this anger so cosmical or so I thought I wore tin chokers and a chain, couldn't see any significance, anger is magical, fists to scissors to drugs to pills to fists again. Did you know a poem can be both mythical and archaeological? 
I ignore the cataphysical and anoint my own clavicle. Um, the next poem I'm going to read, um, I just want to, FYI for y'all, um, a lot of my poetry is about depression, anxiety, and yearning. Um, this poem is called Self-Medicating. Roll out my ligaments, unwrinkle the fibrous tissue, party ready. Tighten the filaments to punch out a one-two step. Still an entire room of photographs marks me untrustworthy, digital grade, fox in the hen house, though my toes never touch ground. I am at the mercy of an artificer woven into the maze tunnels of my ear. She promises Imperium, a false shaman plying me with tones of new milk, fresh enough to make me believe. But what she brings to clean my cuts is in my lungs, vessels and veins reaching out like bows only sting and I cannot release breath. As Eve begets day, I at last wrap myself back in blankets of carotene and mesodermal, bed in my own nails. Um, this poem is called Small Ball. Just 14 and I was never scrawny, always a power hitter and can't nobody tell me nothing. I didn't know shit about shit except for the feel when a round ball hits that round bat squarely, a vibrating pain if it wasn't just right. I knew the feel of raising heat on my face. A cap didn't stop sunburnt cheeks but kept the other team out of my eyes. And I learned breaking from the best, my own family. So I applied every that bit to breaking in a glove like a champ. Oil and more oil, yes, but the key is a big truck. Nothing light or plastic, nothing made after 1985. It was just me, I'm talking 5 a.m. on a Saturday, 14 years old, taking my dad's work truck, laden with tools, nothing valuable. I sit in the driveway, let it warm up before tucking the glove underneath the tire, then back and forth. I would run the glove over and over, listening to the leather give in with creaks and splits. I'd take it out, open and close. If it's too stiff, get back in the cab for a little long longer. Roll over it again. Let the leather loosen up with the day until it fit me, until it wrapped over the ball with ease and reliability. Like we'd known each other always, been together always. Um, so my older brother did one of those DNA tests, um, and it really bothered me when he did it. It really, really bothered me. I was like, A, my DNA is your DNA. You just gave away my DNA. You can't just, like, give away my DNA without telling me. And B, uh, my older brother was in a lot of, like, um, legal trouble when he was younger, and I was like, they already have your DNA. Like, <laughs> why are you trying to, like, I don't trust those companies. We know that they, they, they're connected to, um, to law enforcement. We know they're connected to big businesses. So I was really frustrated when he did that. I was like, I can't believe you would, uh, take my DNA and just give it away. Like you didn't have permission to do that. And also, it was not unexpected. <laughs> like, the results were pretty much what we already knew. So I was like, good job. Um, you gave away all of our, our information. You did this, like, kind of violating thing. And you received nothing in return. Um, it was like, hey, you might be white and Indo combined. And your family might be from Peru and Europe. And I was like, I know. <laughs> That's what I learned from ha from just like having conversations with my parents and like visiting my family in Peru. Um, so it was a very frustrating process. And I did, of course, what we all do uh, when we were frustrated by our family. I wrote a poem. <laughs> so this poem is called Ancestry, 100%. 25.4% can sleep anywhere, napping where I can get it in bright lights of doctor's offices in the cramped chairs of an ER waiting room in the car on a six hour round trip. I refuse a tyrannical sun and make my own days. 7.0% big dreams where everyone I've ever loved gets a house and a car and maybe a dog too if they want. 10.3% 
quick to temper, broken dishes, a shrieking voice that cuts and traps like barbed wire. 32.8%. My, tr my truth stretches, bends, grows into tals, tails tall and long, adds a little flavor, a little mud to make them hold up a little longer. 6.8%. Undefined mental illnesses, BPD, depression, anxiety, pills, pills, rejected pills, self-medication in forms of fried foods and rich sauces in forms of burning whiskey in forms of self-isolation. Starting over is the way of the phoenix, the way of the snake, but what happens when the dead skin cannot be shaken, when the ash clings to the wings? 5.2%. Fresh watermelon melon with a little bit of salt, a crunch of sugar cane between my teeth to suck on all day. 8.1%. Secrets about me, about my loved ones, secrets I write down to myself, burn and candle, bury half under the biggest tree I can find, inject half straight into my skin where one day it will dislodge, travel to my heart to sink like silt in a river. 1.5% unknown. Um, this is a poem called Con Mis Tias. Uh, for a lot of us, um, I feel like in Latinx literature, we'll see tias kind of flock together like a group. Um, there's always like a huddling group of tias somewhere in, in a story or in a poem um, and, and they, they do things in like a collective, like a herd, like a murmur of starlings, the tias move together. Um, but my tias are, are, are very influential and amazing women um, and they were powerful women and I kind of wanted to pay tribute both to them and to that kind of stock image that they get sometimes. Um, so this poem is called Con mis tías. Admonishing in Spanish, just out of my reach, so I learned to understand tone at an early age. They didn't visit often, but I remember one spring they came and it rained for days, that hard Arkansas rain where you just know that tomorrow will be thick and rich, that you can walk barefoot for days and your feet will sink in grass long and opulent. Breathe petrichor straight to your veins. It was that rain that hits pavement and the pavement hits back. So steam rises up soundless and full. But they don't have this, this kind of rain in Peru, at least not where my tias are from. My tias were not still women. They were quick bodies who walked to the store and back no matter the weather, who always found something to clean, whose stoves were never without a bubbling pot, who did not know the word rest. At night, we sat on the front porch, just us women, the only people on our block. It was years before I went to Peru myself, when I would ride in a car through desert after desert, past shanty houses made from tin, surrounded by nothing, to stand on the coast where storm clouds gathered like starlings. The wind pushed at me there, pulled on my hair, undoing each braid returning curl to my hair. But the, those clouds never broke. They just congregated at night, scolded me in thunder, and were gone by morning. Back in Arkansas, my tia sat on the porch in silence with me. And, yet I, and I was a child, yet I didn't need to talk either. We watched the rain. We stay, stayed dry under an arch while tia Jella opened peanuts, passing some to me, passing some to tia Rosi and Reina, keeping some for herself. Her hands, smooth muscle, moved in quick efficiency, a small pile of shells building beside us. Later that night, the rain finally lifted, and I swept the shells into our front yard, where they were lost in the grass, where I didn't think of them again until today. Um, this is the last poem that I'm going to read from this before, uh, before I move to my chapbook. Um, and this is called Soy un hija como mi madre. And it's after the poet artist, uh, Maceo Montoya. Grief does not end when we die. We can feel it in the earth. I walk the riverfront, touch my hand to the ground and then a friend asks what I'm searching for, tells me to see a doctor. 
but I'm not looking for a therapist, just a fortune teller, someone who will be a little bit more results oriented. I step lightly and grass grows, fades so fast I can't see it, just feel it, a flit struck against the balls of my feet. Tar fills my nose, my lungs, my fingertips. There's so many things to fill. How could we think we could get it all done in one lifetime? I return to my home, but in my ears, the dead chat while I cook eggs. Mira, there are still scratches on my knees, bruises where I kneeled, a physicality of faith visible only to them. They child, ¿Cuándo vas a ir a la iglesia? What will I say to my loved ones when I'm dead? I don't know shit about a rosary, about crosses, about any version of a father. Flip it now. Careful. Don't let the yokes break. I clutch a counter and count to ten. Sana, sana, goita de rana. I feel a warmth on my back, creating small circles. I whisper back, si no sana hoy, si sanada mañana. Um, and now I'm going to read some poems from my chat book. Um, a homegrown fairy tale. The first poem I'm going to read is um, entitled uh, Pilgrimage. We are where we were, this world circles. I flew out on the 4th of July chasing a rumor of your past. The Midwest began sending out messages, tap code in the form of fireworks, blurred blues meant keep going, coppers turn away. I thought the guy next to me said sinister in his sleep, but when I turned, he was staring at the seat in front of him. When I got there, it was just an abandoned building, a sheen of oil in the backyard of your home, a personal Gulf Coast, and I bet I could set it on fire if I dared. The smoke from the water would play like puppets on a screen. Here, a shark's fin. Here, a tree. A pollock on sky clear. Then the day appeared and I waited it out on your porch. Nothing lit. At Sunday, sundown, you were still gone and I was too. A friend told me to find you at sea where we could break the dark calm. I spent the night on a rock searching for fins against the dark. When they found me, I broke out of their circle with a long high whistle, a long high call, a long gone thought. The first time, the last time is the same. A plane appears in a sharp lift, neither here nor there. I tried a new depth where I cannot see easily, but there were no surprises, just more mud and gills and I cannot disrupt them. A gold chain around my neck choked me and I swam to shore, ran a lit match. A man asked me for the time, but I shook my head. Children ask me to lay, play, I forget to eat. I can discover unknown shapes on the coast, create them with the push of my body, a form of art that looks like me, that looks like art. Um, and then the last poem I'm going to read is um, also from this collection. And I um, just want to mention that the collection is about uh, Dorothy Gale from The Wizard of Oz. It's kind of like love notes to her. So there are a lot of um, references to The Wizard of Oz. It was something that was really important to me growing up um, and to my own queerness. So um, this is kind of a, a reckoning with being left behind. Um, this poem is called Confession. I admit it. There are things I haven't escaped. I run in an airport even though it doesn't matter if I miss my flight. No one wakes, waits for me in the next city or the next or the next. Crossing state lines, I am pooled. I know I could find a home, ancient and physical in the Amazon, among treetops and temple sites, but I have discovered. Folklore and myth are natural. As natural as falling into sleep under poppies as love between you and me, we have become historical. We are the old story now fresh. Remember the sunsets? I hide them in the forests. They have seen the birds flee the loneliness. They know what is in my heart. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Susie. That was beautiful. Um, I'm so glad to hear things from your book and, and also from outside your book. Um, 
so, so beautiful, your reading. Thank you. Um, it feels so strange we're in this um, virtual space and we can't hear, you know, all the, all the claps or the snaps that you might normally hear in a poetry reading, but um, know that the virtual love is coming your way. Um, thank you so much. Um, so yeah, feel free to tell the poets nice things in the chat because it's, it's a little strange to read to a quiet room um, with just your little host poking in now and again. Um, so anyone who's just joined us, I've just kind of given you a little sense in the chat of um, what's happening today. We, um, we, you just heard from um, the incomparable Susie F. Garcia. We're going to head to Francisco Aragon next and then Jackie Balderrama. And there'll be time for a conversation with all of you and the poets um, at the end of the afternoon. Um, I also just want to welcome um, our pre the president of Westfield State, um, Roy Saigo. I think he, he came in and I um, was so happy to welcome him in, but um, said that before everyone was here and not really in my official welcome. Um, so thank you for coming. That's really um, kind and special to have your support here at this poetry reading today. Um, you've just been a great addition to our to our school and campus. Um, so happy, happy to have you in this space. I mean, this is part of being a student again. <laughs> and I've talked to the RAs and I'll be uh, signing off to go to the honors group. But uh, this is what academics is all about. And I'm a rising freshman, <laughs> I'm learning a lot. And uh, I really appreciate the uh, welcome I've received at this institution. And I am just thrilled with all the things that's going on, even virtually. And like I said, when I came, I had studied every faculty member. And you guys are just out of this world. I'd adopt you anytime. So thank you so much. So I may be leaving, but my heart is here. And Susie, it was magnificent. And my wife waved at me because she says, you're asleep. And I said, no, I can see her words. And, you know, I see better when i am got my eyes closed, so I don't pay attention to the visual part. And so um, I'm tired all the time, but <laughs> I was not sleeping. I was visualizing your words. So thank oh. you so much, Rebecca. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for coming. And yeah, we know you've got places to go and people to see. So when, when you have to go, it's all good. But thanks for being here for the time you could be. All right, folks, so I'm now going to introduce our next reader, so happy to do that. Um, next up is Francisco Aragon. Uh, he is the son of Nicaraguan immigrants, a finalist for Split This Rock's Freedom Plow Award for Poetry and Activism. Aragon is the author of three books, most recently After Ruben from Red Hen Press. Previous books were Puerta del Sol, Bilingual Press, and Glow of Our Sweat, Scapegoat Press. He's also the editor of The Wind Shifts, New Latino Poetry from the University of Arizona Press. A native of San Francisco, California, he is on the faculty of the University of Notre Dame's Institute for Latino Studies, ILS, where he teaches courses in Latinx poetry and creative writing. He also directs, his, directs the ILS's literary initiative, Letras Latinas. His tongue, a swath of sky, a limited edition hand-stitched chapbook was released in 2019. A Canto Mundo fellow, he is also a member of the Macondo Writers Workshop. And for more information, you can visit his website. I will put that um, bio that I just read and his website up in the chat in just a moment. Um, please welcome Francisco Aragon. And Francisco, I invite you to turn on your mic and I will turn off mine. Thank you, Becca. Thank you all for being here. It's great to be sharing this space with Susie and Jackie. I want to welcome all of you. And I also want to welcome a handful of friends who are tuning in from England. I'm going to read uh, five pieces from the new book, After Ruben. And the Ruben is a reference to the Nicaraguan poet Ruben Darío. One of the strands of this book are 10 poems that are inspired by 10 Spanish language poems by Ruben Darío. In fact, the book has a Spanish language appendix so that readers can, if they choose to, see the poems in the original Spanish and then see what I've done with them in English. And I'll start by reading one of those poems. It's titled, Far Away, and I take it to be from the childhood 
of Ruben Darío in rural Nicaragua. Far away. Ox I saw as a child, breath, little clouds of steam, vivid in the sun. Nicaragua, a fertile ranch, abundant, rhythms, tropic, dove in a forest of sound, wind, bird, bull, axe, the core of me are these, and these I praise. Yes, ox, lumbering, you evoke tender dawn, the milking hour, when days were white and rose. And you, cooing mountain dove, recall April, May, when spring was all, was everything. And that is from section one of the book. And I'd like to share one other poem from section one. And after listening to uh, Susie's poems, I, I think that some of the poems I'm reading today will be, are sort of in a dialogue with hers. We, she was in Peru, now, now we're back in, in Nicaragua. This next poem, takes its inspiration from what I would describe as a family heirloom, which is the only surviving photograph of my mother's father, which is to say my grandfather. And in addition to the photograph, the poem is inspired by stories that my mother told me about her father growing up in Nicaragua. And I'll just say that there's a reference to a volcano in Nicaragua named Momotombo. And Nicaragua's currency is called Cordova. Photo, 1945. The only photo of you, black and white and torn, the frayed edge climbing your chest, just missing your left eye, cutting off your ear. Only your face was spared. The link is your daughter, youngest of 11, lifting the hem of her cotton dress above her knees. She lowers herself onto pebbles and beans you've carefully arranged on the ground. Sitting nearby, you raise your head, peering over the pages of La Prensa to discipline a child with your eyes until you think she's had enough. She kneels perfectly still. Later, you rise from your chair and stretch, noting in the distance a slice of sun, how it hovers over Momotombo, smearing fire across a jagged horizon. Time for drinks and a game of cards when a certain mood seeps into your skin. Hurry. They're waiting for you to deal the first hand. Summer air laced with insect sounds soon fills with the small bells of Pedro's approaching cart, peddling the ice he scrapes and then flavors with syrup. Knowing you well, she scrambles to the table, your chair but you're ahead of her. Having heard the jingling too, you've set aside a few Cordovas next to your tin cup of beer. Your large, dark hand cups the back of my mother's head as you kiss her forehead in front of your friends, pressing the coins 
into her palm. Abuelo, I'm holding you in my fingers, a broken window you gaze from, a face I've never really seen or touched. Section two of the book is arguably perhaps the, the, the portion of the book that it's the most political. And I'll share with you one poem from this section. The poem is what it's, what's called an erasure. And by that, I mean that I have a source text, which is not by me, but by someone else. And the method is to white out many of the words and only leave a few of them visible. I would say whiting out approximately maybe 75% of the words, leaving only 25%. And those that I choose to make to leave visible are the poem. And the source text is a poem by a poet named Andres Montoya, who sadly died 20 years ago at the age of 31 from leukemia. But he's, his, he's the namesake of a national book prize called the Andres Montoya Poetry Prize. And the poem, I, I keep his title, his, the poem's title is Tinochitlan, 1523. Tinochitlan being the indigenous name for what we now know as Mexico City. And 1523, giving us a time frame of when this is taking place, which is to say, when the, when, when the Spanish were encountering indigenous populations in the New World. Tinochitlan, 1523. Strange, while fishing. Sun lowering itself. Everyone wondered, unknown bird, the vision over and over. Men rode, throwing blades, a new game. Men wild with hunting, chopped skin, burnt, Feet, all of it, stench, pain, the surprise, shock, so, 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 desire, everything, not enough. This next piece is from uh, section three of the book, which deals primarily with poems about my father. It's titled, We Talk Dogs. Some of the people who make an appearance are my older sister, Maria, um, my mother. In essence, part of the poem is about my parents' courtship in Nicaragua in the 50s. There's also a reference to uh, two boxers, the great American boxer, Aaron Pryor, and the Nicaraguan boxer, Alexis Arguello, who had two legendary bouts in the 70s. And it's a phone conversation. We talk dogs. Or the one Maria found trotting along the banks of the Yuba the river, his name, red scarf around the snowy neck, that week of camping coaxed onto the back seat and taken home. He mentions one, de raza alemana, he says, and I'm almost charmed by the voice telling how he'd tie his German shepherd to a pole, escort her to church. Plaza Santo Domingo, flanked by the park, kiosk beside the roasting beef, pleasant 
olor de carne asada wafting to the bench after mass where they talked, she mostly, her sewing, her trip to Panama in search of wholesale fabrics. I'm trying to picture it, Managua in the 50s, my father's plane lifting off, touching down, sending for her months later, big with Maria, as I'm also trying to picture him on the other end of the line in his 60s, portly, sugar in his blood, a whiff of something on his breath as he speaks of the Sacramento River, pole and gear, six pack, rocky and comet slinking behind. But the car is busted now, he says, basting in gravel near Chico. He gets to bed past three, watching Christina, the Tuesday night fights sunk in a beat up armchair, replay of that memorable bout, Aaron Pryor delivering a flurry of shots to the head, Alexis Arguello absorbing them. During the phone call, we talked dogs. He had three. We had two. Something, I suppose, in common. This talk of ours, a first. And I want to close by reading the first paragraph of the essay that punctuates the book. The essay is in three parts and it's titled My Ruben. And part one of the essay deals with, in part, the Ruben Darío of my mother's childhood and my mother. And it starts with two lines of poetry in Spanish by Ruben Darío that go like this. La princesa está triste. ¿Qué tendrá la princesa? Los suspiros escapan de su boca de fresa. Tell me the one about the princess, I'd say. And she'd readily utter these two lines. Except for a set of aqua blue encyclopedias, ours wasn't a household replete with books. And yet, during my childhood, this arrangement of words about a sad princess sighing through strawberry lips would float free from my mother's own lips, standing at an ironing board, on the couch, watching a telenovela, seated at the kitchen table, removing tiny pebbles from a pile of uncooked pinto beans, nothing kept her from retrieving this poem, one she had to learn in the early 40s as a schoolgirl in Nicaragua, though she never went beyond the sixth grade. You might say then that my mother's favorite Ruben Darío poem had become part of her DNA, her breath, something she passed on to me. Thank you very much. Oh, wonderful, wonderful reading. Um, again, I'm like, oh, the silence is just so strange. But um, oh, Francisco, that was just spellbinding. You read so beautifully. Um, and both of you so powerful, but in different ways. Um, so this is really cool for students to see how people can present their work and, and how important it is to, to read and, and really be in, in the space. Um, I've, I've done that to some of my students who are reading their personal essays over Zoom in our little um, conference, um, our little conference rooms together. Um, so this is a good lesson. Thank you, beautiful. Um, 
All right, we are going to move on to the third and final poet so that we can then have our conversation with all three. Um, so I would love to introduce um, Jacqueline Balderrama to you. Um, she lives and teaches in Salt Lake City, where she is a doctoral candidate in literature and creative writing at the University of Utah. So she is still in a student role um, herself, like some of you, which I think is really cool as well. Um, she's the author of the chapbook Nectar and Small from Finishing Line Press 2019, and her first full-length collection, Now in Color, won the 2020 Perugia Press Prize. Balderrama is a poetry editor for Iron City Magazine and Quarterly West. She has been involved in the Letras Latinas Literary Initiative, the ASU Prison Education Program, and the Wasatch Writers in the Schools. And for more information, you can visit her website. I will put her bio and her website up in the chat as well. And um, welcome to Jackie. Jackie, I'm gonna turn my mic off and have you turn yours on. Welcome, Jackie. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's a true pleasure to be here virtually with all of you. Thank you, Westfield State and Francisco and Susie. Um, yeah, it was wonderful to hear your words and thank you. Uh, Becky for moderating this. Um, okay, so um, I will be reading from Now in Color, new book, um, and this roughly sort of focuses on the themes of my Mexican-American ancestry, assimilation um, in early color film, and um, sort of the struggles migrants are facing currently on our southern border. Um, so anyone, can, everyone can hear me okay? Thumbs up? From people on screen? Okay, great. All right, so um, I'm gonna open with the first poem and the book is sort of roughly broken into 13 sections um, that are sort of around uh, Spanish definition poems. Um, and I did not grow up speaking Spanish. Um, I studied it in school, I'm still not proficient, um, but part of this work was sort of um, coming to some kind of acceptance of that and uh, reconnecting a bit with my Hispanic uh, Latinx heritage. So, esperanza, esperanza, noun, feminine. Migration is written on this green heartache of home, once its own discovery of water. The Aztecs met Tlitlico, meaning place in the center of the moon. Some are used to hopes being where they've been, but singing one octave is Kansas to Oz. For a while, my father didn't know that the movie changed to Technicolor since the family TV was black and white. I love that we have themes of Oz, uh, Susie, in our work. <laughs> That's just one poem, um, but yeah, it was a fun discovery. Now in color. Migratory patterns of monarchs continue alongside gray wolves, armadillos, coyotes. Now paper, now papel, we learn to listen in different ways. And again, someone asks for the source of me, as if water could stop or would. Agents dress us in the terms of their casting calls. Anonymous beneath the sombrero, or fiery Latina, or gardener, or alien, or drug lord. Now Maria Montez, Katie Gerardo, Rita Hayworth watch themselves in the funny mirror. And my mother shakes her head for the childhood dog the neighbors took in, then abandoned in the desert. Now the wildfires on the San Bernardino Mountains. At night, families set out lawn chairs to watch the flames and a man electrifies his fences and shows the reporter large photos of bodies he's found beneath his trees. Now the radio is breathless. The television, like an escape portal, streams color through undraped windows. But inside, we are still here, fumbling to turn on the light or floating down in our chairs, wishing the room to unleash its plum, its marigold, the blue of our jeans, the white walls covered with frames. We peel heavy shadows from broomsticks, coils of rope, strangers, admitting somehow we can still have good days. Somewhere desert poppies will grow with all of this and without it. 
Um, so this next piece, um, I so I studied creative writing in my undergraduate. Thank you. Um, but I'm I was also sort of in the midst of sort of deciding if I wanted to be a visual artist or a writer. And I think obviously you can do both. Um, but I took advantage of um, taking some art classes while I was studying writing. And one of the things that we practiced um, was using a mirror to sort of assess how our portraits were going. So if you're doing a self-portrait, mirrors are really useful. I mean, obviously for you to see yourselves or if you're painting anyone else um, to flatten out the image. Um, but if you sort of push your painting to be reflected in the mirror, it's also really useful to sort of um, help you see it a little bit more correctly. Um, and so this poem sort of deals with that and also thinking about um, assumptions people of color may face, um, getting questions like asking where they're from or if they speak a certain language um, and as far as responds a little bit to that. Um, study of two hands. We hold fruits, deciding how good they are. Avocados, Saturn peaches, cherries, plums. Our shapes we've memorized another way, balancing and passing through doors, so that running the brush on paper might always do our will. We will turn the self-portrait, face the mirror, where our reflections will look in on each other, the way peach halves regard their center. But the mirror's portrait doesn't match my reflection. Wide-eyed and misshapen, it may have achieved all that strangers expected of me. Or it may only know the meaning of the light and the dark, laid side by side on the palette before mixing. Nevertheless, it is me too, in the mirror beside the portrait. I hold it like a sign which reads, my skin has only been where I have been. Water, 2014. Their homes have melted in the crossfire. Children bring water as much as they can carry from Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala, Mexico. That same week, over a thousand children have crossed, coyotes pointing them toward border patrol, then disappearing the way they came. It might mean relatives, court dates, or untreated colds, cement floors on which to sleep. At night, relics of the desert are socks, medicine boxes, tires dragged over one's footprints. A prayer hinges on the wings of a gilded flicker foraging the ground for ants. In migrations which ended here, an interview of checked pockets, discovered bones are held at the morgue for questioning. They had found the blue capped water by Crisote Bush, promised colored caps of full gallons, azul for water, rojo for juice, sticking up from beneath the desert floor, but someone had uprooted them and stabbed the plastic. Rueda, Rueda, noun, feminine. To make pinwheels and paper rosettes, I'm told to begin with squares and rectangles, folding edges into the center. They spin as if they've forgotten this origin of steps. We too forget our feet. So part of this book has to do with film um, and also connecting to ways or films that my grandparents might have seen and kind of thinking about them back then and their experience. Um, and either sort of resonating with the characters on screen or kind of criticizing or looking at how they may have been exoticized or assimilated to fit um, certain categories. So this one has to do with Maria Montez, 1940s actress. Um, uh, I think she's from the Dominican Republic, uh, but uh, she has sort of a special connection to my grandmother. The Queen of Technicolor, 1943. My grandmother is 15, entranced by color. Islanders paddle to shore with loads of papaya, the ocean sweeping the sand, spilling from the screen. All eyes ahead, it's Maria Montez, this time royalty in plumeria headdress. Yellow coral violet bloom around her and in her. My grandmother's family changes the spelling of their last name to match, Montez, 
to Montez, mountains to mountains. Part of the giantess exists in her. And it's true, it's Celia Montez like the movie star. Montez, the queen of technicolor, is always in love, or in the moment right before being in love. With a stern face, my grandmother's mama tells her the queen is not serving her husband enchiladas and beans. She is not telling her children to pray. My grandmother doesn't care. Montez's sleepy eyes call the audience in, and this is her secret. If you were like her, a princess in the tropics, a Persian queen, cobra woman, you'd be in love too, or about to be. For my grandmother, the hum of her Spanish accent under the English words is the fisherman's line in the meat cute. She, like Montez, is home in a paradise from which all colors illumine, sent forth on waves to the shore, to the promenade, to the dance hall, where girls like her wait for their stories to end in a kiss. She will know what happens soon enough, when at 19, my grandmother marries Enrique, her last name disappearing in those starry children chasing one another to their Anaheim motel. She will outlive Montez, who dies in her reducing bath at 39, and she will say her father's name to herself, Pedro Montez, will recall his singing De Colores on the local radio. Um, so this next piece is after photographs by Michael Ruger of Melanie Griffith and a lion at her California house. And so Melanie Griffith was a teenager at the time and she and her mother, Tippi Hendren, were preparing for this film Roar that involved a lot of big cats on set. And so to prepare, I don't think this would be done now, but they had this full grown um, lion staying with them at their house for about a month. Um, and these are sort of photographs that reflect it. And I encourage you to check them out. They're sort of uh, as wild as, as you're probably imagining they are, um, but I'll describe a few of those in this poem here. It's called In Bed with the Lion. They sleep each covered by the red blanket. Lion's tail plumes out from under like the thick cord of a church bell. Or they are awake, watching each other be still. They compare hair and nails against the rosebud print of the sheets. Or they are pretending to sleep, one hiding from her mother, one from its nature, which has never left. They lie quiet as if dead. Or one is awake, watching the other sleep, considering the live-in trainer's request that mother, daughter, and lion use their inside voices. Or they are waiting for the photographer, waiting for the pool where she can pull lion's paws through her wet hair like a heavy brush. Or since the lion is apparently named Neil, they like to believe in a world that would allow such things. Let's see. Okay, two more, one small one, and then I'll sort of finish up. Um, hablar, a blar, verb. The parrot chooses not to speak or say so when tired of teaching it. Keep a room for only that language. Place the bird cage inside the room whistle and coo, find the parrot teaching you. Um, and I'll end with a piece I was sort of writing. Um, I'd gotten engaged and I was sort of thinking about changing my name. Um, and so this was sort of a letter to my last name in preparations, I guess, of saying goodbye. Um, sort of growing up as, as I did, I kind of always expected that I would take on the name of the person I married. Um, by the title of my, what's on the book that didn't happen but at the moment um, I was sort of um, seriously considering that. It's called Valentine to the Disappeared and um, it sort of looks at um, my ancestors that have brought that name from Mexico over to here. Valentine to the Disappeared. Dearest, the hum of a hundred years finds you in the divided flesh of an orange tracing you back to Northern Chihuahua. 
Once wealthy ancestors are now a caricature head, a caricature of large heads and long legs. They say, even on horses, their feet dragged on the ground. After the revolution, you belong to fruit pickers, grocers, motel owners. Now there's a judge, a professor, less chihuahua. Some of us have forgotten how to speak with those dead, which means a boy made to feel ashamed in his learning the language will not learn. He cannot teach his daughters. Now the feeling returns in me for not knowing the words. I am told half of you means bucket, balde. The other means branch, rama, water for grafted trees. I call you little name because you turn invisible in new mouths have been spoken by so many you can't be heard anymore. Little name, as myself, I've always been ready to send you away like a nutshell boat weighted down by a pebble into dry stream beds. It is like that with anything built to be given. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jackie. Um, listen, folks, I'm going to just ask you to unmute and just clap for everyone, please, because that was just a beautiful reading from all three poets. So snap or clap. <laughs> bring, bring the love. Um, and, and you know what? I'll remind you to um, bring it on into gallery mode so we can see each other um, and have a conversation. Um, and this was just beautiful. Um, Francisco and uh, Susie, your work is somewhat new to me. And so hearing it was like a discovery and um, Jackie's work, I've been close line editing and laying out in this book. And it was just such an honor to, to do that with Jackie. Um, but I, it's still a discovery to, to hear it out loud um, in your voice. So that was beautiful. Um, thank you all. So um, you're welcome to throw a question up in the chat um, and you're welcome to just raise your hand or jump right in. We have a, a manageable group, so it's, it doesn't have to be too complicated, um, but we have until 5.30, so don't be shy and then think, oh, I didn't ask my question. So um, throw it out there. And if you want me to ask it for you, you can throw it in the chat if you're not super comfortable. Um, but anything, you know, we have three poets who are um, some of them teach and they write and they either are still students or w once were beginning writers. Um, so some of you might want to ask about writing or about their poems that you read, um, heard today. So, um, and just to remind you, if you do want to be all fancy and raise your hand, you can do that in the participant area. So um, I am going to kick it off with a question while you think about it and get comfortable. Um, so I have a bunch of things that I, I um, want to know about. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess I want to start with a, a question that would maybe touch some of the undergrads in the audience. Um, we have undergrads in our audience. We are a graduate school, but um, I'm wondering if among them, there are probably some aspiring poets. And I wondered if you could maybe each talk about your path from being a student to being a published poet. Um, and are any of you still involved in being a student um, or in teaching future poets? And, you know, spoiler alert, I already mentioned that Jackie is in a PhD program. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, just give us a sense, a little bit of a sense of how you got from there to here, or if you're kind of still, still there. Um, what advice might you have for aspiring young poets? That's a huge question, but jump in with any, anything that you um, feel like hanging on to in that question. I'll share that I was an undergraduate in the, in the mid 80s at UC Berkeley. And probably the most um, transformative experience during those years was joining the staff of the Berkeley Poetry Review. So I had the experience of coming into contact with other students who also had an interest in poetry and the, the experience of reading, reading the slush pile, so to speak, and having weekly meetings to discuss poems that we wanted to pass on to the next round. So that was a very influential experience. And then I took, I began during my second year of college, uh, signing up for creative writing workshops. And that was a revelation. And so it, my interest began 
in, in, in college. And then it blossomed further when I lived in Spain for about a decade after college. And uh, in terms of advice, read voraciously. Read voraciously and widely. Read poetry you don't necessarily like but can still learn from. Um, and I guess I'll stop there and see, see what Susie and Jackie might want to share. Yeah, um, I got started in, I went to community college um, before I went to undergrad and I got started there. Um, I was always interested in editing. I didn't actually consider myself that creative of a person. So I wanted to be in editing um, because I love to read so much. So, but to be in editing at my community college, you had to take a creative writing course first. Um, and that really exposed me to contemporary poetry. And I was like, oh wait, I think um, this ain't so bad. <laughs> so uh, that kind of really got me into more contemporary poetry and kind of guided my own um, my own career in writing poetry and obviously I still edit that's a huge part of my life um, and I just want to say that as and then I you know I went to undergrad where I continued um, and got my bachelor's in arts with minors in gender er, from in, with um, a degree in English with minors in creative writing um, and then my MFA from Notre Dame where I got in creative writing with minors in gender studies and screen cultures so um, I continued that path once I kind of discovered it. I will say that one of the most inspirational parts of my writing experience is community engagement. So I highly advise finding poets that you admire and connecting with them um, at all levels. My mentors are a major part of my writing process, but so are my peers. So are the people that I advise. Now I, miss, uh, I advise students on a student journal at the University of Michigan. So I mean, every process, every angle that I can get to when it comes to poetry inspires me to write more. Um, but especially just being with, with community, it really helps. Yeah, um, for me, uh, my, my computer, so my internet connection is unstable, so I hope nothing <laughs> terrible happens. Um, for me, I, I was like writing uh, trying to write novels in like high school <laughs> and send those out sort of was a sort of a very naive attempt but gave me a sense of like what it's like to work on a bigger project um, and so after sort of finding an interest there at just like a high school level I pursued um, majoring in creative writing at UC Riverside um, and there I met some wonderful faculty and uh, really had a writing community there um, I was engaged with um, the literary journal there, Mosaic, much like Francisco was in his undergrad, and uh, participated a bit in the open mics that we um, hosted in order to fund that journal. And so um, that sort of paved the way to thinking a little bit more that I could actually pursue this um, in graduate school. I didn't know before then that uh, there are programs out there that uh, will pay you to teach in exchange for your education to get your MFA. So if you are interested in something like that, um, ask your faculty mentors and I'm sure they can tell you more. Um, and I've pretty much been in school ever since. After I went to my MFA at Arizona State, I continued on to University of Utah for my PhD. Um, so that is like one route. Um, for a writer, but certainly not the only route you could take. Um, but yeah, what advice to you. Um, one way I keep writing, especially when I'm out of ideas, is to fall back on description. Um, so I think there's a lot of resources out there to um, write from, whether they be news articles or artworks. Um, or something that you're just sort of trying to get your head around, just putting that down in language, I think is a really good start for, for any poem or story. Um, yeah, looking forward to the rest of your questions. Oh, those were such good answers. And you, you really just remembered all the different things I threw out there at you in my 12 layered question. Um, yeah, so what are, and I, I know there's some resonance happening because I know some of the students who are in the room, so, um, yeah, we have, we have like Meg is here and she works on the literary journal. Um, and actually, um, 
Meg was one of the um, student judges this year for um, Perugia Press, so she helped to pick your book, Jackie. Um, so I just want to connect the two of you there. It's kind of a cool thing to meet each other virtually. Um, so yeah, what, what would folks also like to hear about? Um, these poems were so rich. Um, let's see, Corinne said in the, in the chat about just all of the sort of ways that these poems touched on each other. It was as if you'd gotten together and planned, and I know you didn't exactly, but, um, you know, Oz and photographs and the 40s and history and mythology and family um, erasure and reclaiming. It just, it felt like it was just a beautifully braided reading. Um, so that's just a comment, but I know Corinne had mentioned that um, incredibly connected within and without um, with the imagery. But yeah, questions or other comments that you wanted to ask about? I see Lexus. Ooh, we have a hand up from <laughs> Lexus. Bring it, Lexus. Um, so if you guys ever get stuck in like a writing block or don't really know like where to go, where do you guys go from like for inspiration? Like where do you draw your inspiration from? I can go first. Um, so I was saying um, artwork mostly um, or, or nature. I'm sort of, my current project is working on environmental poems and social justice poems. So um, just being attuned to the news and trying to humanize people who um, I feel are being victimized um, is sort of part of my current project um, and sort of trying to perceive nature um, that isn't necessarily just a projection of human feeling onto nature. Um, so getting down to the nitty gritty and details of maybe like describing what a bird looks like or what their habitat is and how they live. Um, I find that to be really useful, rich information to work off of. I also say that I know it's something I struggle with a lot, but feeling like the need to write something every day or every week and deadlines are great as students um, to be a motivation. But I think oftentimes, even if you're not physically writing, um, it's, it's important to like listen and to know that your sort of creative self is sort of absorbing and thinking about things that might be more difficult to just start right away um, and to not sort of at least talking a bit to myself and to you all, like no, don't beat yourself up about like not hitting a certain uh, word count or whatever it might be, uh, but to know that like you're paying attention to the next idea that will come uh, when you start writing again. What I have found useful <clears throat> as an ancillary project that perhaps requires less so-called inspiration it's, this is especially true if you have command of a, of a second language, and that is trans, trans, translation. Um, having a poet in another language that you admire there as a resource, you have, you have material there by just, just simply trying to render a poem from another, from another language in, into English. It's its own form of creativity, and I would, I would argue it's like writing poetry as well but you're just using another text as inspiration. It doesn't require you to feel like you have to be inspired by the muses by some particular memory, but just having at your fingertips uh, 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 another text. And I would even say, taking it a step further, some of the most fruitful exercises that I've done in, in graduate school and over the years is taking another text as a springboard uh, for, for a new poem. So that's one that I, that I like to turn to, sort of like like the erasure that I read that I read today. Um, yeah, so there are a couple of different things I do when I can't like get the writing going. I like Francisco. Um, I have you know other projects. For example, I don't translate. Um, that would not be effective. Uh, <laughs> but I do uh, edit, so sometimes, you know, uh, going to other people's work helps. Um, reading, of course, helps, but I also take notes all the time. I have notes everywhere. I have um, notebooks, and I also have a, a note document that I update 
every month on my computer um, where I just have like lines or ideas or things that weren't like when you edit and you take things out of a poem, I usually throw them in that doc, um, et cetera. So I try to pull from that and see where the writing's going. It doesn't have to be good, just getting the flow going. And that's what the revision process is for to see if there's something there. But um, I don't think you need to write every day or every week, but I, when you start feeling concerned, when you're like, wait, it's been a minute since I've written, it can be a little creaky to get back into it. And so those notes and things kind of help me find engagement. And also, of course, projects. Um, erasures are really helpful when you can't think music. I mean, the first draft doesn't have to be the last draft. So it doesn't matter what it takes to get writing or how it looks when you first put it on the page. It's the act of getting back into the writing that's important. And then you can go back and revising is also writing. So thinking of it that way is really helpful for me. It's as if I paid them to talk to my composition students <laughs> and said, please talk about the importance of revision and community and listening and thinking and things percolating. This is amazing. Um, yeah, these are lessons that writers, all writers can take. So whether you're writing academic writing in your, you know, comp one classes, like my students are um, this semester, um, or whether you're aspiring poets yourselves. Um, and we are really working in my classes with um, humanizing and um, listening, right? Like all of these things, um, I know that my students are thinking like, wow, this is just what we're talking about in class. So it's, it's really great. Um, and the importance of revision, that's lovely. So really great nuts and bolts suggestions there, as well as sort of philosophical approaches to how to think about um, approaching, approaching writing and revision. Um, I see Devin has his hand up. Devin, go ahead. Um, do you have like a favorite, like, like a, Type of poem you prefer, like if a type of poem, a type of poem you prefer, like a, a classic, po a classic poem or a sonnet, or like a long form or a short form or iambic pentameter. Is there like a certain like type of poem you prefer to write? I, 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 I can... yeah. Good oh, question, yeah. Devin. Yeah, I can uh, speak to that. So I often write free, um, but I also, I do love a villanelle. You know, I read one of mine tonight. I, I like the challenge of a form. I am not always that um, interested in keeping true to the form. For example, it's a modified villanelle. I love a broken sonnet. I think that challenging yourself as a poet with forms is really interesting and exciting and forces you to think in a way that maybe you're not always um, going to think if you can just use whatever word or whatever style or whatever there. So um, I like the challenge of a form, but I I don't think that I uh, consider forms to be the end all be all. They're just, that's another great tool. If you're, if you're having writer's block and you have like one line, find a form that you haven't done before and start trying to create a form out of that line. Um, and you'll be surprised at what comes out. It's, you know, it's got you researching words and ideas and, and sounds and makes you think about language in a really interesting way. Thank you. For me, oh, go ahead, Francisco. Are you sure? I'll sh yeah, I'll, I'll share a, an exercise that I was exposed to in, in grad school at UC Davis oh, 20 years ago, in which I still go to. And that is uh, finding a poem that you admire, preferably not, you know, not a book length poem, but you know, a poem that doesn't go beyond a page. And take the poem's rhetorical strategy, its grammatical scaffolding, and empty it of all the content words, and fill in your own content words, and see what you come up with. And that could be the first draft of a poem. So you already are constraining yourself by its grammar and its rhetoric, but you're just taking out the verbs and the nouns and the adjectives, and then you put in your own and then you have something completely different, resembles, it resembles structurally what you started with, but with your own words. And then that could be the first draft. You can refine it or do, do whatever you want with it, but that's a, a way of getting, getting, you, getting you going. 
I'll say I mostly write free verse. I, I still feel like a lot of the time I focus on narrative poems, even if they don't sort of turn out looking that way by the end, but just the idea of telling a story. Um, and that was sort of the transition I made between really focusing on fiction in my undergrad and then transitioning into poetry and my graduate studies. Um, I was introduced to Philip Levine, who writes some wonderful um, narrative poems um, and just sort of saying like, oh, well, there's a story in a poem and I, I know how to write a story. Um, and then just sort of thinking about ways in which you can make decisions about line break, cutting words, um, really looking at the sentences to make sure that every word is sort of pulling its own weight, that every sentence is sort of the best sentence that it can be, um, I think is sort of a useful exercise. And I also, when like students might be struggling with like, I don't know where to put line breaks or how to think about rhyme or all this, I'll just say like, just write it out longhand. Don't think about breaks or anything. Write what you wanna write. And once you have that sort of free write or draft, then you can kind of go back with like an editor's eye to sort of cut and add language as needed. Yeah, thank you. Great answers. Um, I feel like that those give folks so many different ways in. Um, there's so many different ways to be a writer and a poet, you know, just like there are to be a human. Um, so I have a question. I wonder if, you know, one of the, I, one of the suggestions is read, 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 right? Just read voraciously, read everything. Um, I would love to hear just a couple of maybe contemporary poets that each of you are reading that you would suggest, please, you know, check this poet or that poet out um, because it, it's, um, so poets can steal. You've just learned that from Francisco, you can steal a form and, um, and copy. And, you know, we hear all this stuff in English about don't plagiarize and everything, but when you're getting creative, um, you can do that in your creative process. And if you end up with something that has a remnant maybe that's left of somebody else's, you might want to attribute that to them. Um, you could say, you know, it's after Francisco Aragon's poem or something. Um, but yeah, the other thing we can steal is um, prompt ideas and also reading ideas. So maybe you could each give us a couple of things you would say um, we need to definitely not miss these days. I will say that the past few years, I've always assigned Natalie Diaz as one of the books for my students to read. Her, um, When My Brother Was an Aztec was her first book, and she recently came out with another one. Um, but that is a really rich text that is from a Native American perspective, which is one I don't think we have enough of. And um, her imagery is really rich in the way she sort of presents that, especially in the title poem. Um, and then recently, I haven't read much of her work, but Lely Long Soldier, um, she gave a reading yesterday and I was just amazed. Um, and she deals a lot with sort of uh, thinking about the poem visually on the page in terms of like concrete poems or discovering a reading poem a different way in sort of this like diamond shape poem, which I was fascinated by. So I'm, in, in my own work, I would love to pursue more sort of mixed media moving on, but I think she would be a really interesting writer to check out and to kind of see like how poetry sort of breaks the assumptions of what you think it is um, and how it might look different or be experienced differently. I'll mention a book that I actually haven't read yet, but I'm about to read. Um, Ross Gay, the African-American poet, just, just came out with a book, uh, I think it's called Be, be Holding. And it's a book length poem about Dr. J, the basketball player from the 70s and the 80s. And he gave a presentation last night virtually at City of Asylum. He was being interviewed by Patrick Rosal. And uh, it apparently it's a book that takes on Dr. J as a sports figure, but incorporates history. It's, it's sort of a book that you, he throws everything in. He read from it, it sounded really, really good. Um, a book that I have read that I admire recently is Eduardo C. Corral's book, Guillotine, which was recently profiled in The New Yorker a couple of weeks ago with Grey Wolf Press. It's also a book that deals with the border, but also his queerness. Beautiful, beautiful writing. So those, those would be my two recommendations. And Francisco, would you put up in the chat? I missed, I was trying to write these into the chat, but maybe the second book yeah. that you mentioned. Thank yes. you. 
Um, so I'm going to recommend Ida Limon. Uh, she is a poet who has been super um, influential on my writing. Um, I was lucky enough to work with her and she was like, have you considered writing about this? And I was like, girl, you're wild. Um, but she, she writes some, the language of that she writes in is so conversational and yet so insightful simultaneously. Um, Caring, I think is her latest book, but any of her books are really just um, beautiful and fascinating and they bring me joy. Um, I haven't read Finna yet by Nate Marshall, but that's on my list. Um, if we're talking about books we haven't read yet, but we're excited to gra grab. Uh, I Nate was in grad school at the same time I was in grad school. We didn't go to grad school together, but he went to grad school with my partner. Um, and I've been so excited to see his language uh, and his style transform. He was originally a slam poet. If you know the documentary Louder Than a Bomb, he was a part of that. Um, and he, his, his language and his writing is so fascinating. It's so different than my own. Um, I think that it's so essential to listen to conversations that other poets are having, uh, even if I'm not part of the conversation, but part of the audience. Beautiful. So we, we only have a few moments left, but um, I, I would love maybe as like a final um, go round, just kind of, to, <laughs> we are having this reading for Hispanic Heritage Month and um, we haven't really talked about that in the comments or the questions. Um, I was wondering sort of um, if you could talk about your relationship to the Latinx community or maybe, um, I, I mean, I are, we all heard the ways that um, some of your, of um, your ethnic and linguistic and cultural heritage comes into your work. Um, so maybe just briefly address um, that piece of your work if you if you could quickly. It's kind of a large question um, and here we are with only a couple of moments, but I did want to acknowledge um, the context of when we're having this reading. I guess I'll just say, um... I'm going to echo something that I read by the by the Puerto Rican poet Urayon, Urayon Noel about this question of Latinx identity, and I'm I'm most interested echoing him. I'm interested in in the conversations surrounding this question, but not trying to pin down uh, categories of what it is and isn't. One of the things I I enjoyed about t this afternoon's reading was that we were the three of us were coming from distinct communities. Um, if I had to say one thing that we might have in common, that is that all our stories in one way or another includes a story of migration, however we want, however we want to describe or define migration, whether it be physical or, or even internal. But beyond that, I'm most interested in uh, the complicated questions around the subject and not trying to define or pin down the subject definitively. I will say for me, just to kind of get an idea of where I'm coming from is that, uh, as I saw earlier, I, I didn't grow up learning Spanish. My mother's white, my dad is Mexican American. Um, and so it was sort of not a community I necessarily felt a part of growing up. We didn't have a lot of the tradition traditions people might think of um, within sort of that category. But um, I also want to thank Francisco Aragon. Um, I was involved in his Letras Latinas community while at Arizona State um, for an outreach chapter there, which is basically just uh, other people in MFA programs who identify in some way to the Latinx community, sort of gathering, sharing, and kind of um, just supporting one another. So that really felt like a turning point where I really felt welcomed into this community and that I could also contribute to it. Um, and sort of um, this book in a way is sort of uh, accepting who I am and also that, you know, Latinx community, Hispanic heritage um, involves or includes Spanish speaking and non-Spanish speaking people and doesn't necessarily sort of have um, really strict bounds on, on what that is. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, um, I had a very similar uh, upbringing as Jackie. I grew up in the South in Arkansas, which did not have a large Latinx population when I was growing up. It does now. We have like a Mexican consul and it's awesome. But growing up, it didn't. Um, and so, uh, and my mom is also white and my dad is Peruvian. So like a very, which is very different culture than Mexican culture. And growing up in, in America where the dominant like Latinx cultures are um, Mexican and Puerto Rican also make it very like interesting to think about how South American culture is different and language is even different, um, et cetera. But um, one thing that I really felt strongly about is when I got to start uh, communing with Latinx poets or even just Latinx people in general, um, we'd sit around the table and there was something about us that did not feel fulfilling as far as Latina dad. Like we'd all feel like, oh, I'm not Latina next enough because I don't have papers or I don't speak Spanish or I don't come from Mexico or I come from Texas and not California because California and Texas have very different Mexican cultures too. Um, so there, there, each of us had an ideal version of what a Latinx person should be. And the only thing that had in common for each of us is that we all failed. Like our own fails, failures were kind of um, epitomized in our ideals of what a Latinx person should be. And so that's why I know the reasons community is so important to me. Um, and in writing, I really try not to perform my Latina dad, just like I try not to perform my queerness. And for me, both are just part of who I am in my writing. And I hope that it comes forward in the aesthetics or in the culture that I'm representing. So it, it can be hard to be in a space like Canto Mundo um, or anywhere where you feel those insecurities onto you. And that's why it's important to be transparent um, with your community because that's when you start having these conversations and they're like, oh my God, it's not just you, it's me too. Um, and you can feel more secure in yourself. And that's a lot of what I try to do in my writing is just be transparent, clear, and be myself even when I'm insecure. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah, you're, you're, it, that definitely comes through in your writing. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you everyone for staying a few minutes over. I'm sorry to ask that important question at the very end. <laughs> um, but thank you all for coming. Thank you for um, reading poets. Thank you for supporting supporters. Um, Chris and Emily, you're here. Thank you for being my, um, my wingman, Chris and Emily. Thank you so much for helping me to um, support and um, throw this wonderful reading. Um, so have have a wonderful night. Um, I feel just so inspired by all of you and um, great. So I appreciate that. This was a gift. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you all. Everybody. Is thank you. Thank you. Uh, Please, bye. Thank you. Bye, Devin. Thank you for coming. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you bye. so much for coming.